Hello and welcome to today's European SharePoint Office 365 and Azure Community Webinar. My name is Shane and I'm delighted to be joined by Thomas Mauder, Microsoft Switzerland, who will be talking to you today about modern Azure cloud operations for IT ops. Remember to join in the conversation about today's webinar on Twitter. Our Twitter handle is at European SP and our hashtag is ES. PC20. Don't forget to check out the Resource Center. This is updated daily with the latest blogs, ebooks, webinars, and how to videos. Simply visit SharePointEurope.com and click the content link at the top. This week, 25th to 29th of May 2020, all week, join us for free Azure Learning online with Microsoft MVPs and industry experts. See sharepointeurope.com forward slash Azure dash week for further details. After the webinar, we will have a questions and answers session. Type any questions you have in the questions window. Questions will be selected and answered at the end of the presentation. This webinar will be recorded and added to the resource center where you will be notified by email when it is available. And now I'm gonna pass you over to our webinar presenter, Thomas Mauder. Hello, Thomas. Hello, hi, and thank you very much for having me. Um, so I'm happy that you all joined uh, at this time to this webinar. Um, again, my name is Thomas Maurer. I work as a cloud advocate at Microsoft and I'm part of the Azure engineering team. So we are responsible for creating content, delivering content um, online, but also in-person events. And another big part of what we do is basically getting your feedback and going back to our feature program managers and feature teams to tell them, hey, how do our customers want to improve our products and what is working for them and what is not working for them. In this session, um, we are going to talk about modern Azure cloud operations for IT ops. And I get this a lot that a lot of people telling me, hey, uh, Thomas, look, I'm currently as an operations or an IT administrator on prem. Um, and when the cloud is coming, there is nothing for me to do anymore. Um, and that is definitely not true. There's a lot of IT operations work going on in the cloud. And I think that session is kind of like an example of what that means and how we're gonna, uh, what the task of an IT operations person will be in the cloud. And we're gonna have a look at a lot of technical stuff. I prepared a lot of demos for today. So we're gonna run through a lot of like examples and, and but also have a look how it actually really works. So to get started, one of the important part here is that if, like we've seen that many, many times that people, as soon as they go to the cloud, they mean that like, even if they just use infrastructure as a service or virtual machines, they think that this is then a really experience, right? Where they just get the VM and they don't need to take care of it. Um, that is not necessarily true uh, because like it's true with past services and SaaS services and so on. But if you're using, for example, infrastructure as a service, it's different as well as you need to take care of your Azure environment. We give you so many possibilities and you probably don't want to give access to everyone to deploy the largest and greatest virtual machines. And um, we're going to have a look at that, how, how that will look like later in the presentation. So cloud operations really is a shared responsibility. Right. So we are taking care as Microsoft of the physical assets like the data centers, like the locations, power, cooling and all of that. Also of the physical servers and everything basically in the data center. That is that is not something you need to worry about. That is what we take over when it comes to the cloud. We also make sure that these data center operations are run securely uh, and in an efficient uh, environment and also like that they are stable. And the same thing when it comes to cloud infrastructure, which doesn't mean just like hardware, but also the software we build to manage all this infrastructure in Azure or the Azure environment. However, we see that basically as a joint responsibility when it comes to then the workloads you deploy. This can be virtual machines and virtual networks, um, which you deploy in Azure. And 
as you would do that on-prem, if you do that, you still need to take care of making sure that the operating system is um, secure and patched. You need to make sure that you track changes. You need to make sure that it is configured in the right way, that your network is configured in the right way, because you don't want to expose your virtual machines necessarily to the internet at all time. And then, um, same thing if you deploy apps, right? Even if you use PaaS services or and, and things like that, you want to make sure that they are configured in the right way. And then when it comes to data, we give you a lot of different options, um, basically how you can store data and how you can secure data and encrypt. But this is also something you need to take care of. So we want to provide you with great tools to make sure you can do all of that. But still, the person who needs to configure it in the way um, they want it uh, will be you. So this is something we're working on. Now, speaking of what we take care of, um, it's really about uh, building that secure foundation, right? Um, and you can see here, we, there are multiple aspects of it. I already mentioned those. This can be the network, this can be the data center infrastructure, the storage, and all of that but also how we operate and run our cloud infrastructure uh, to make sure that when we run out um, new features that they are actually um, deployed safely so they don't interrupt any customer workloads. Uh, we use machine learning and AI to predict failures to make sure that when we know that with all the data we have and telemetry we have from our hardware, we can, for example, predict in some cases, when a hard disk is going to fail or when a server is going to fail. And when we know that a server is going to fail and, and has like, like it looks like it's going to fail in the next couple of hours, we can basically go out and like move our um, customer workloads proactively. And all these investments we are doing also when it comes then basically to roll out new services or when there is a event happening. For that, we have, for example, uh, our cloud uh, center here our cloud collaboration center where teams can come together when they roll out new Azure services um, and basically work together. And you see here the huge screens on the side. You can also see that a little bit uh, larger here um, where you, we basically can project all the data, the Azure data on it and can see immediately impacts if something happens to Azure. So that is what we do in the background. And there's obviously much, much more going on than this, but now let's talk a little bit about what our customers need to do and for that we are going to use a example company called tailwind traders and i'm sure many of you are already familiar with that company some of you may be still familiar with contoso which is kind of like a, a pre like our demo company for a lot for the last couple of years but now since we're going forward we think tailwind traders is the new company we are dealing with and this company really represents everyone and no one at the same time, right? So it's like really to do some examples. However, most of the things we're going to show you or the problem statements I'm going to show you in this presentation um, will probably affect a lot of different customers as well. So we're going to use that as an example. So before we start with that, for this presentation, to make it really that you get all out of it, I also we also added something called lightning demos. So I will like just in the middle of the presentation and all at like a specific point in time, I will also add some lightning demos just to show you some cool features um, we have in Azure. And so the first one I want to show you is basically the um, create VMs from Azure Cloud Shell. So to show you that, here we are in the Azure portal. Uh, you can see here I have a couple of virtual machines. If I want to create a new virtual machine, I can obviously use the portal. I can use the CLI, the uh, PowerShell on my machine, but I can also use Azure Cloud Shell, which is, as you can see here, a web-based shell, uh, which I can open up here. And then I can, for example, type my password. I can then run CLI commands. See here, this is basically the normal Azure CLI command to create a VM and connect it to the specific network. And if I run that command, you can see it will create that VM for me. So very simple. So instead of like going out and installing um, like the CLI tools on your machine, uh, you can just basically go out and open up Azure Cloud Shell uh, in the Azure portal. And you get in the back end, you get a container with all the tools already installed for you. 
uh, to use. So you can run scripts, um, CLI commands, but also Azure PowerShell uh, and a lot of other tools as well, like even third-party tools and so on. So let's go into the problem statements we have. And I give you a couple of different uh, examples here uh, with Tailwind traders. Um, what they need to do if they run in a cloud environment. And the first one really is about how does Tailwind traders make sure uh, that, they, uh, that their administration is safe and the connection to their Azure IaaS virtual machines is safe and secure. So for that, we have a couple of different options which I want to go and show you. And the first one is Azure Bastion. And by default, like when you deploy a VM in Azure, if you use the portal, um, you basically get a public IP address assigned to that virtual machine. And also per default, you get like an open port for the, if it's a Linux machine, SSH or RTP for uh, a Windows-based machine. Now, again, this then invites people to basically run brute force attacks, right, to the, those virtual machines. So in an enterprise environment, if you move your virtual machines and they don't need to be exposed to the public internet, you want to basically just give them private IPs. But now, how do I manage them? And to manage these, usually what we have a recommendation is that you build some sort of a jump host, right? That can be usually it's a virtual machine. Um, you're put in Azure, you secure, and then from there you jump to the specific VMs to manage these. Now, again, a jump host adds additional complexity. You still need to manage that jump host. You need to make sure that you patch that jump host and that's all secure and also costs you some money. So we built a service called Azure Bastion, which basically allows you to go into the Azure portal and basically replace that chump post, right? So Azure Bastion really is a service and it's not just a VM. It's like in the background, it's maybe a VM, but you don't need to take care of it. It's just a service for you, which you can run. So for that, I want to show you how you deploy Azure Bastion. So you go to the Azure marketplace and you search for Bastion and then you can basically find here the Azure Bastion. And first, what we're going to do is we go into our virtual network. So we go into the virtual network, which we have already existing, and we need to create a subnet for this, for Azure Bastion. So we're going to create that one because that is where the, in the subnet where the Azure Bastion instance is going to be deployed. So we call that Azure Bastion subnet. It needs to be that name, that specific name. We will then click on OK. And then we added that subnet to that virtual network. Now we can go out and basically deploy Azure Bastion. So for that, I go and click on create new resource. I'm going to enter Bastion here. And you will see here Azure Bastion, which we can actually go out and deploy. So we're going to create the Azure Bastion instance. Uh, this is also needs to be part of a uh, subscription, a resource group, and we give it a name. And then we define a region where we deploy this Azure Bastion, and that, that will also relate to the virtual networks we run. And this is the virtual network we have there. And you can see here, it automatically selects the Azure Bastion subnet. And then Azure Bastion also needs a public IP address, but I will talk a little bit about that later. Because now your virtual machines don't need a public IP address, so you can use private IP addresses. So deploying Azure Bastion will take a little bit of time, but thanks to our video editing skill, um, it is quite fast. And then we can have a look now how we can use Azure Bastion. So we go to our virtual machine, which we run here in Azure. And now you can see that this uh, um, virtual machine only has a private IP address. So I can't actually go out and there's no public IP address assigned. So just from the portal, I can't really connect to that. Um, you can see a private one. I would need a, a VPN connection or anything like that. But now I can just click on the connect button because of Azure Bastion. I can just go here and say, hey, enter username and password for that specific VM. And click connect. And this will now open up a RTP connection in the Azure portal using a web UI 
basically to basically connect to that VM and do some administrative tasks, right? So now here I have the server. I can see here, I can administrate this server. I can go out and um, do certain things. So this is Azure Bastion. And again, Azure Bastion is great if you want to admin, uh, like be an admin for that. Uh, don't get me wrong. This is designed for admin tasks and not for like virtual desktops for end users accessing it. For that, we have a service called Windows Virtual Desktops. And so how it actually works is, so as a user, you basically go to the Azure portal using TLS encryption. And then from there, it connects to your Azure Bastion instance, which has a public IP address. So the portal also encrypted and from the Azure Bastion instance, it then opens up a connection to your uh, virtual machine with a private IP address within that virtual network. And so you get this end-to-end -end encryption basically to until your private network starts. Um, and so you don't have like any problems like um, basically with attackers going off like brute force attacks for HS SSH or RTP connections. Good. Now, there's also another technology. In some cases, you want the public IP address assigned to your IP address. And then what happens, usually, again, you're open and exposing uh, an RTP port or an SSH port. Now, in some cases, you want, for example, to give a external uh, company access to your uh, location, uh, to your VM. Um, but they are not part of, the, of your Azure Active Directory. They, you don't want to give them access into the Azure portal and stuff like that. You just want to give them access to your specific VM. But however, you want to protect that. So for that, we have a service called Just-in-Time VM Access. And if I go back to the Azure portal here, uh, I'm now in the Azure Security Center. And that is where I can configure Just-in-Time VM Access. It's also part of the Azure Security Center service. So what I can do, I can basically go, let me make some more space here. And if I scroll down here in the Azure Security Center, you can see here that I find a just-in-time VM access. And now you can see here I have some recommended VMs to configure. I select um, the VM and then I just tell them enable uh, VM access. So I'm going to configure this. And for this VM, because it's a Windows VM, I don't need the SSH port. So I'm going to remove that. And in that case, I also don't want to have the PowerShell remoting port. So these are the default ports we basically give as a recommendation. Um, and now we just want to have this port. We can also then say, hey, what is the maximum time a user can request that specific um, access to that specific port? So let's put it for 10 hours because the admin maybe needs 10 hours to um, work with that. And so we save that. And this will now configure the VM access in that way. And now, if I'm an admin, I can go and request access for that VM. So here I see now the port um, which I can open for that VM. So I can go and say, hey, okay, I want to open this port. I can then also say for how long I'm going to use um, this specific access. So I can like go, so, okay, maximum is 10 hours, but maybe my admin task is done after like two hours. So I'm going to limit that as well. And then I can also see here in the middle of the screen, you can see here, it only opens that specific port for my IP address, like my public IP address. However, I can also go and say, hey, I want to open it up for a specific public IP address. So if like, for example, an external company needs to access it, I will need the external IP address of that company, and then I can do that. Now I can click open port, and this will now open up the port um, for my VM. And so if I go now to my virtual machine, I can now go and say, hey, I want to connect to it. And can then access to the public IP address. Now, again, this is this port now is only accessible from my IP address, right? From my location where I am. So if someone else wants to connect it, that will not work um, if they're not in the same internet connection as I am. Um, again, so this is a very secure way of quickly giving someone access. And again, the access to this will also be locked and you can audit it and see who, want, who basically added um, access to a specific VM. 
So now I'm here in this VM. So that is just in time VM access. Again, a very good service if um, you want to open ports up to a public facing uh, VM. So let's switch to another lightning demo quickly. And um, this one is about PowerShell remoting from Cloud Shell. Now, you've seen that we just did like RTP connections using Bastion or um, using um, just in time VM access. But sometimes you also want to just have a PowerShell um, um, connection, right, for PowerShell remoting. So I can do that as well. So here I have um, Azure Cloud Shell open. And what I can do, I can basically go out and start the PowerShell experience. So I'm gonna save here my credentials, my username and my password for the specific VM, because I'm using that for my remote connection. And now I can go out and enable this. So what happens now, it enabled um, PowerShell remoting, I can now enter that VM by using enter ACVM. And you can see here, I'm now in the Azure uh, VM. I can also check out like services um, and basically do all that interaction. I can also go and install features, for example, like wins. Um, people sometimes ask why wins, um, because it's, it wins and it's not loose. So you can then actually go and manage your VM using PowerShell. That said, in this case, you can also see that this is a public IP address, right? I configured like this command enable um, to enable the PowerShell remoting, thus basically configure the settings to be over the public internet. So be aware of this. This is not like super secure, right? So make sure you know what you're doing here. It's not using private IP addresses. It really uses public IP addresses, which again can be absolutely fine, but you will you want to be aware of that. Um, Good. So the next thing I want to talk about is I showed you now a lot about VM management, right? But it's for, for administrators, it's not just about managing VMs. Um, uh, it's also about making sure that the environment is configured directly, right? Uh, correctly. So you want to make sure that like your VMs are secure, that not everyone can just deploy VMs with public IP addresses, for example. You need to make sure that it can be compliant, for example, that you say, hey, um, in my company, we can only deploy um, services in specific Azure regions because we don't want to leave a specific country. We don't want to store data in another country. So we need to configure the environment uh, and block certain Azure regions from being used. And then also a big part is like cost management. So when you think about um, cost management, we have some great V like, like really large VMs out there, um, which you can have. Um, uh, some of them, I think like hundreds of cores, um, 12 terabytes of memory, and they drain your credit card in like three seconds. Um, so you also want to make sure if you give developers access to the Azure portal that they not can go, they don't can go out and just deploy these for every workload they want, right? So what we have there is something called technical governance. And what usually happens when someone starts a cloud project and they realizes, hey, we need this, it's something like this. So you have the team um, which is responsible for the cloud environment, uh, which we call uh, the team or person, which we call kind of like the cloud custodian uh, within Microsoft. And that's basically the team responsible for managing the cloud. And the traditional approach really was that they stand in front of the cloud and everything developers or other operations people want to deploy needs to go through them. But with that, they lose, like all the developers and operations people or the whole company loses the speed and agility uh, the cloud offers, right? Instead of having like a VM created in just a couple of seconds in Azure, we now need to go through an approval process and all of that, which then can all again bring it back basically to like weeks to deploy uh, new services. So what we want to do is we want to give the cloud custodian or the cloud operators um, a tool set to make sure that they can um, keep the control of the Azure environment, but at the same time give developers and operations people access so they don't lose um, uh, speed and, and flexibility 
to deploy new services. So what I'm going to show you here, a couple of examples, what you can do. So the first one, when it comes to governance, I want to show you is how you can actually get visibility into your cloud environment, right? If you set up your cloud environment, you're probably familiar with subscriptions and you have subscriptions over all over the place in your company. You give someone access for like some department, a different subscription. You give another one a different subscription. You give one other team a subscription and you don't have to control anymore what they're actually deploying. So you want to see and build an overview. And for that, I want to introduce you to Azure Resource Graph. Azure Resource Graph really allows you to get an overview of the Azure environment. And I'm going to show you this here. So here I'm in Azure Resource Graph Explorer. Now you can see here on the left side, I have a couple of resource providers, uh, which will help me to build queries. In the middle, I can basically build my query to get like resources out, to list all my resources. And then you can see in the bottom, you see the results then. Now I can, I could help like use the help with the resource provider on the left side to basically find out okay what's going on uh, or i just go out and copy paste one a query which i already have now this query here this as you can see here it lists all my resources which are microsoft compute virtual machines so that means azure vms and then summarizes the count uh, and that by OS disk type. So basically what I get, I get a list of how many Windows VMs and how many Linux VMs do I run. So if I run that query, you will see here, now I have 13 Linux VMs and 13 Windows VMs. Now again, a list is great, but if you need to show that off to management, you probably wanna have some color and some charts to make that more visible. So what we can do here is we can go and we can list charts, select the bar chart here, and then we can basically say, hey, look, nice colors. Uh, and you can now graphically see that there we have the same amount of Linux and Windows VMs. And I can also save that view um, and that query. So I can basically go out, say, hey, save that query for next time. I can just run it. I don't need to enter it again. And I can also pin it to the dashboard. Now. You can see here then when I open in my Azure portal and open the dashboard, I can immediately see that count and it will always update. So if I remove now a VM, it will show up in, in, this, in this graphic as well. Now the Azure portal, I think itself and the dashboard is probably one of the most underestimated um, tools we have in Azure because like when you go into Azure deployments, a lot of people tell you, okay, hey, if you actually go deploy, you're going to use like automation, you're going to use the CLI, you're going to use PowerShell, you're going to use ARM templates and infrastructure as code to manage that and maybe use Azure DevOps to do infrastructure as code using pipelines. And that's all great. That's all true. That's like a very good way of doing it. But the, the Azure portal can really help you when it comes to visibility. So I show you here an example which shows a little bit a more advanced dashboard. So you can see here, we built a couple of queries which show, for example, um, some of the Azure Compute inventory, the storage inventory, the network inventory, it can go down. You can basically do that for all the Azure resources like databases, app services, containers, and so on. And you can build that query and to get an overview of what's going on. And if you wanna edit something, you can just go and click on it. And then you can basically edit that query uh, change it and then save it and it will show up. Now there you can get a great overview um, on your portal using Azure Resource Graph. And again, if you want to look at this, there is also some examples. So the dashboard I just showed you, you can get that dashboard to download so you can import it in your environment and then just start editing it. So that is Azure Resource Graph. It really allows you to get visible visibility across your subscription, across your management groups. It's not limited to a specific subscription. You see what's going on in your whole Azure tenant if you have the, the right permissions. Um, and then you can use the portal, but you can also use the CLI and PowerShell to do these queries and do exports and, and for maybe put them like this information in other tools. And these queries, it's also very important. I told you already that they're using the keyword query language. Um, maybe some of you are familiar with the Custo query language, which uh, basically is the same thing. We just renamed it to que keyword query language. Uh, and we use, also use that in log analytics. Now, what's also important is, like if you ever have been in a large Azure environment, 
with let's say like hundreds of virtual machines and you did like run in Azure PowerShells um, to get list all the VMs, you know that this will take a while to complete because then it goes out and queries every single VM in that Azure environment. Now with um, Azure Resource Graph, we are caching all that information, right? So even if you have thousands of VMs, you get like just in a couple of seconds, you can basically list everything which is going on because we are doing that, we're caching that information uh, for you. So another important part I already mentioned is not just getting visibility, but also keeping things compliant. And what I want to show you here as an example is how does Tailwind Traders assess their environment to make sure that they are PCI DSS compliant. For those um, who are not familiar with PCI DSS, this is basically when you store credit card or credit card information, you have like you need to certain have a certain compliance um, to do that. Otherwise banks will not really work with you. Um, and so this is something we built in. But you can also imagine that we not just have that for PCI DSS, we also have that for other um, uh, certifications as well to help you. So we built a couple of tools in there um, to basically assess your environment and see what's going on. And for that, we're going to use um, Azure Policy and Azure Guest Configuration Policy. And Policy is a really powerful tool to configure your Azure environment. And for example, again, allows you to block um, certain Azure region, the different VM sizes. You can go out and um, tell people like, okay, hey, I want, don't want to use this, I want to use that. So what I'm going to show you here is how we can use Azure guest configuration policies to even audit not just the Azure environment, but also the operating system running inside an Azure VM. So let me show you here. I have some resource groups listed. And here I'm in a resource group where I have... Um, the resources I want to audit. And so if I go to policy, you can see here now I have a couple of things going on. So I can see the compliance view, and then I can also assign a new initiative. Now, an initiative is basically a collection of policies, but for now we just call it, let's assign a policy, um, but really it's just a collection of, of different policies. So we're gonna go and pick an initiative. And now you can see here, if you do that in your Azure portal, you will basically see the same thing. We have a couple of built-in policies here, which you can use. So for example, I'm gonna um, select built-in, and if I scroll down, you can see here, I have one to audit PCI version 3.2.1 2018, controls and deploy specific VM extensions to support the audit requirements. Now, what this says is it's not just checking the Azure environment, but it also checks the VM configuration, right? Using the VM extensions. Now I'm going to deploy that, I'll give it a description. And then I'm going to assign this to this specific resource group. And now this will now go deploy and check all the resources in that specific resource group for all these requirements we have for PCI DSS, right? Because they'd already stored all these policies. And if we go and have a look at this, you can see here that there are all the policies and rules in that initiative, which um, we need to be compliant to. And now it tells me, hey, this encryption should be applied to uh, on virtual machines, for example, and tells me you're not compliant and you have 10 resources which are not compliant with that. And you can see here all this, the set of PCI um, controls I need to implement. And now I already know what is not configured the right way, right? Maybe I, I, I thought I did it for everything, but then I forgot it for one VM and then it will show up using these policies. Now you can see here I have a lot of um, compliance. Uh, some of them, I like you can also see I have rules which I am actually compliant, but I really care about the ones I'm not compliant and I really wanna fix that. So what I can now go and do is, we can, for example, have a look at this one um, and then we just create a remediation task. Now, so you can see here, this one is for deploying prerequisites to audit VMs that do not have a maximum password age of 70 days. So it wants to make sure that we also have set like in the guest VM itself to make sure we have the right configuration. So what I can do is I can then create, uh, have a look at it and see all the VMs which do not have that requirement. Then I can create a remediation task 
And now I can basically deploy that and audit VMs um, to have that specific setting. So Azure policy and Azure guest configuration policy uh, is a great tool to basically do that. And what is Azure policy? Azure policy basically is a rule that will be enforced. Uh, there are many different ways you can do that. Uh, and an initiative basically is a collection of different policies. And then you basically do an assignment where this, these policies or that, that initiative should be applied to. Now, Azure policy can do a lot. So what I want to quickly highlight really, really quickly is also that in this environment I just showed you, we just went out and said, hey, we want to audit that environment and we get that information. But and that is what we recommend to most people when they start with Azure policy, that you first start like auditing, right? You want to make sure that you see everything which is not compliant. At, well, at the later point in stage, you can basically go and say, hey, I won't, don't want to allow people to deploy anything which is not compliant. So the deployment actually, if they want to deploy something which is not compliant, it will actually fail. So that is something where Azure, Azure policy is very powerful. And again, it integrates into VMs using Azure Site Recover, uh, Azure, <laughs> Azure Guest Configuration Policy. And then also in Azure Kubernetes Server, for example, where we have a preview for AKS. Now, I told you there are some built-in policies. If you don't have, like if you don't find the policies you need, you can write them by yourself. There's also a repository on GitHub where you can already find um, policies from others. And for those who deploy workloads using um, like an, a, a CADC pipeline, using, for example, Azure DevOps, that's great, right? Because now what you usually would think is, okay, I'm checking my ARM templates. I'm going to deploy this. And then it runs against the environment. And as soon as something is not compliant, it will fail. And that's very, that's not how it should be. Because then you always need to wait until actually deployment happens. Now, since Azure DevOps and Azure Policy integrate into each other, before we actually go into deployment phase, we can already validate these Azure policies and say, hey, oh, this is going to fail because the policy you set um, to that environment is, for example, blocking that you can deploy a VM in the West Europe region. And your code you just checked in wants to deploy a VM there. So you don't have to wait until the deployment is happening. You can already validate it before you actually deploy it. So for these governance tools in IT ops, we have a couple of different uh, features here um, for management groups, for policies, uh, blueprints, resource graph, and cost management. Again, I couldn't show you everything of it that we don't have enough time, but you get an idea. Someone needs to take care of governance. And that is usually someone in the IT operations space where they need to take care of all of that. And so that's a lot of work which needs to be done um, we give you the right tools for this. So we have, again, with policies and resource graphs and cost management and blueprints, and management groups. We can give you all these tools, but someone needs to configure it and implement it into the right way and then also manage it uh, for that environment. So you can actually keep control of your environment. So let me show you the next lightning demo here. And we are going a little bit back to VM management. In this case, I'm going to quickly show you how easy it is to, for example, change the size of a VM. So I'm here back in the Azure portal. And you can see here my Azure VMs running. I can then go to size. And you can see here I have a couple of different sizes. I have a size attached. So what I can do here is I can clear my filters here. And then I get the whole set of possible VM sizes. Now, keep in mind, I cannot change like everything, um, every VM size to another VM size. It really depends on which family of VMs you are. But here I can go and say, hey, I want to change that VM to another size. And that is how easily you can resize that specific VM when you need more power, but also to make it smaller if you need less. OK. So the, one of the last demos I want to talk for today um, really is about um, update management, right? So I want to keep um, my, every company basically has, has the, the, the need of being like compliant with their update policy and make sure that all their Windows VMs as well as the Linux VMs uh, are up to date. And that's the same thing if you run them in Azure. But in Azure, we have a tool called Update Management. And so I want to give you a quick demo how that looks like. Here we show our Azure VMs. And if I go scroll down here, 
under operations, I have a button called update management. And here I can go out and add that specific VM to my update management solution. So what it is behind it, it uses log analytics, it uses an automation account to basically um, orchestrate all that, um, that update install process. So I'm going to add the VM, and again, with some magic of video editing, we can um, make that a little bit faster. And now I can see here that this VM is basically compliant, but it has a couple of missing updates. So I'm also going to do that. Let's do that also for a Linux VM here. I showed you that in a Windows VM. Now we have a Linux uh, Ubuntu VM here. So we're going to also enable update management for that specific VM. And I can also say, hey, please enable update management for all my VMs in this subscription. So I can make that easy that everything is joined, um, uh, which is running in that VM. So I can enable, enable that for all of them. Uh, and I can also say, okay, for, I don't want to enable it for this one. So we see here, we're going to enable for most of the VMs in my environment. Now, if I go back to one of my VMs here, and if I go to um, Update Management, I can now see here, okay, I'm, I'm compliant, but I'm like, I have missing updates. So let's install these missing updates. And for that, I'm going to deploy a, or create a new update deployment. So I'm going to select which kind of updates I want to be installed. I can also include exclude updates if I want to. And then, I can also go and say, hey, okay, I need to schedule this. So because I don't want it just right now, I want to schedule it um, and to a specific time. And say, okay, I want it to update then. I can also create a recurring task for this. So I can say, hey, always go out and install the updates like every week or every month. I can go and run some pre and post scripts. And then I can also uh, configure the maintenance window and I can also say, hey, what's the task after? these updates are installed and usually reboot if needed is a good thing to do. So I've now created that deployment schedule and I can see here, okay, these are the missing updates. And I can also see the inventory here of these updates. I can now see that they are installed. Well, if I go to the inventory blade, for example, so because that is, that's the thing we already run. So if I go to update management here, I can also go back to see all my VMs, how all my VMs are doing. So I'm here in the update management solution. And you can see here now, all my VMs are compliant and there are no missing updates um, directly there, which are needed for compliance. But I can see here that I have some which are not necessarily need for compliance, but they are there. And so I want to update them. So I create another deployment job here. And then I can basically go out and say which operating system I'm going to use. I'm going to configure that again, can then add a group of virtual machines, or it can just go out. In our case, we just quickly select the VMs I want to go and install. So I can then go and, as I could before, I can basically go out and de deploy that. And here I'm really doing it at scale, right? I'm doing it now for a couple of VMs. So I'm going to say, hey, every week, basically, on Tuesday at 4.50, or let's say 5 p.m., you're going to install updates if they have any required updates. And then I can run a pre and post script and again, reboot as required usually is a good thing, but I can also say, hey, don't reboot or always reboot anyway. And I can then basically go and say, okay, create that update deployment. And this one is now a scheduled one for multiple VMs. So you can imagine, even if you have hundreds of VMs, I can basically automate the update process. And now when we come back after a while, you can see here that some updates missing, but we can also see that we have some of these installed. Again, these are new ones which are uh, available right now. And if I can see here, my VMs, my Ubuntu VM, for example, 
that one has no missing updates, no security updates missing. So update management is really, really powerful um, to manage updates, operating system updates for your Azure VMs. It doesn't matter if it's Windows or Linux. Um, it basically goes out and checks every couple of hours um, if there are new updates available, goes verifies it, does an assessment, and then goes out. You can then schedule the deployment, and again, it verifies again um, what is going on. Now, this is not um, this me doesn't mean that it's limited to Azure VMs. You can also use Azure Update Management for your on-prem VMs as well, or for VMs running at other cloud providers. So you have this single control plane, um, which allows you to basically manage updates across your environment. For Windows machines, Linux machines, physical, virtual, um, basically wherever they are running. And if you have on-prem, you're using, for example, WSUS, or if you're using a private Linux repository, um, it will leverage that. It will not just go out and just use your internet bandwidth. It will still use WSUS, um, but it gives you much more control of how updates are going to be installed on your servers. Again, this is designed for servers. If you're looking for a solution for that, a cloud-based solution to manage updates for your clients, then you want to probably look at Microsoft Intune. So I want to give you another lightning demo. We are almost at the end, and this one is about password reset. And I think not a lot of people know about that because I, a lot of people are like redeploying their VMs if they forget the password for it. But there's a quick and easy way of resetting your password in a VM. So I click on the VM. I scroll the way all the way down and there's a reset password button. I enter the username and password, click on update, and that's how simple I just reset the password of an Azure VM. Right? Um, I can also go out and reset, for example, RTP configuration. So if I like killed my remote access, for example, SSH or RTP, um, I can basically go and just re do the reconfiguration for that um, to make sure that um, I have access to that VM again. So I cannot lock myself out in that case. Good. So uh, we also offer inventory and change tracking together with, for example, the update management solution. I just want to quickly highlight that, um, which then can go out and check the third party solutions or changes to Azure VMs, um, uh, as well as the software you install or the changes, when did they happen, who did the change and all that. You can find these logs centralized in Azure Log Analytics. And I quickly showed you in the demo, the update process, how that looked like. So the last thing I want to show you is auto shutdown. And as you all know, you pay for VMs usually um, for like, like pay as you go. There are certain options you have with Azure reservations and stuff like that to make sure that you save a lot of money, but you pay up front for, um, or you commit basically to running that VM 24 seven for the next year or the next three years. Uh, but usually you have pay as you go. And so if the virtual machine is not running, the only thing you do is you pay for storage. You don't pay for the virtual machine. So in a lab environment or something you wanna do uh, is probably shut down uh, the VMs and you can configure auto shutdown for VMs. Now, so you can go down and click on a VM. And then if you see here in the menu, you have an auto shutdown options under operations. You can enable this and you can configure the time and time zone for when the virtual machine should be shut down. So um, this one, for example, we configure for Australian time. We can even say, hey, please send me a notification email that this VM is now shut down. And in that email, you will even find a link which will tell you, hey, um, I want to postpone that um, uh, uh, that shutdown for tonight, for example. So I can basically say, hey, okay, um, th th tonight I don't want to shut down that VM. Um, there's also a question usually, can I also do auto start? Yes, you can also do that. Um, for that, you're going to use Azure Automation. So you can basically plan your auto start and auto shutdown for all your VMs. And you can configure your whole environment to basically shut down at a specific time and then also start specific VM at a specific time. So this is really great. You can build all that automation for your virtual machines uh, as well. Now, if you want to learn more, I highly recommend that you look at the Azure Administrative Certification if you want to bring your skills to the next level. Um, this does not only give you the um, like like the certifica certificate itself, and which is always great, right? Uh, but it also helps you to basically dig in into the different administrative tasks or IT operation tasks. And that's why I recommend basically have a look at this because there's much, much more than I just showed you. 
um, for IT ops people in Azure available. So with that, I want to say thank you very much. Um, and we go over to Q&A. Uh, thanks for a great presentation, Thomas. Yes, we will now start the questions and answers part. And should you wish to ask a question, please type it into the question window now. OK, Thomas, uh, there's a question in here. Is it possible to share Cloud Shell storage account behind for the whole team? <laughs> yep, that's a question I get very often. So um, there's a, for those who don't know about Cloud Shell, Cloud Shell is a container in running in Azure. And then you have that web UI, which I showed in the presentation. And it uses a storage account and an Azure file share to save that container data. So when you do changes on that uh, or you install some additional tools in that container, uh, it's basically saved. So you have persistent storage. You can also save scripts and stuff like that. Now, a lot of questions people ask, um, can I share this um, storage so that everyone can use basically the same uh, tools or the same scripts and stuff like that. Um, so that is not, I mean, you can share it, but it can only be attached to one contain, container in, in, in per se. So it's not designed to uh, be like, like run multiple users with the same um, storage account and it's create it, it is actually possible because you can change the storage account and configure it and you can uh, do mount commands and stuff like that so it's not i would say it's not impossible to do but it's not the intent to use it in that way the intent to use what i recommend usually people or it administrators are looking hey um look at azure uh, the azure cloud shell as a container for every single admin but if you want to share for example scripts and files look at something like um uh, source control. Look at like a simple Git repository where you store all the git, um, all the scripts or or files you need, and then you basically just do a Git clone, and you everyone every admin can clone it down to his machine, and then basically basically have that. And if you need some file shares shared between the containers because you probably also copy some other files, um, then you would create an additional. Azure storage account with an additional file share, which can, which you then can mount using some Linux commands, basically to all the containers. But again, if it comes to sharing scripts and sharing the environment, I highly recommend that you look at at source control, like creating a, a source like a Git repository, either on GitHub or on Azure DevOps. Um, you don't need to use all the DevOps tooling; you just can just use the the, the Git repository. That's especially what I do. Okay. Brilliant. Uh, next question. In Update Manager, how do you know which software has an update? Is some is there some repos configured for that? So that sounds like someone with a Linux um, um, a background is basically um, asking this because you asked about repos. Yes. So what you have is basically you. It will take. Um, the repos which are installed on your machine, so uh, or like uh, configured on your machine. Uh, that I should say that not installed, but configured on your machine. So if you have private repos, it will can like the machine can check against these private repos, and Azure um, uh, Update Management will leverage that. Especially also if there are other repos connected, um, it will leverage that and find that information what is available. So it will same thing for WSUS, for example. If you're using WSUS as your update source, um, Azure Update Management will will deploy the updates from there. Or the machine will basically get triggered to download and install the updates from WSUS. So what Azure Update Management just goes out and triggers the update process and 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 verifies what updates need to be installed and what what are open. But it does not. Uh, it's not a, a repository or a replacement for WSUS in that case. I hope that answers the question. Brilliant, um, Thomas. There are all the questions that we have. So on behalf of the ESPC community, thank you for taking the time today to complete this webinar. We uh, we really appreciate this. Thank you very much. Uh, it was a pleasure uh, to speak the, to that community. I'm really looking forward uh, to speak in person at this year's event. Uh, really looking forward to that. Great. Thomas, thank you so much. Okay, everybody, um, just bear with me here for one moment. Uh, that is the end of today's webinar. Um, 
Please see SharePointEurope.com for further details on all upcoming webinars or visit our resource center where all previous episodes are available. Thank you all for joining us today and take care and goodbye.